All right, so we'll go ahead and record the cloud. All right, so uh, this one's probably a, let me close this so nobody interrupts me while I'm doing this thing real quick. There, make that go away. All right, so um, welcome to uh, number five. Who knew how we'd be doing five? I had originally planned to do four of these things, assuming that we would be back in our offices, and uh, apparently uh, we're going to be doing this a little bit longer. Um, not sure how much longer, but I planned forward another four sessions uh, if I need to do go through them. Um, but uh, at this point, I'm I'm certainly open if folks have uh, particular things they'd like to have um, questions about. Uh, let's go ahead and start this up. Uh, so if I'm assuming folks can hear me. If someone can just type in a chat that you actually can hear me, uh, that would be great. Okay, fantastic. So we can go ahead and go forward. All right. So this session um, is uh, I'd been uh, is going to be on mark on two specific parts of mark edit. So um, over the last couple of years, uh, one of the things that I've been spending some time working on um, in the applications thinking about um, how mark edit will interact with um, link data, link data frameworks that are being created um, and how that uh, would be supported um, as well as uh, what kind of things you could do with the application um, to take advantage of link data. So um, it's, my guess is it was probably one of the first tools that um, allowed you to do some of the things here um, that we'll talk about. Um, I've also been thinking about how we can actually make use of, of the tools that are there. So it, it, it honestly doesn't do any good um, to have um, a lot of these, uh, these um, uh, tools built um, if we can't actually do something with them. Uh, and, and honestly, um, that's probably been one of the biggest things that's been disappointing is in the three years, the three, four years, the library community has been seriously talking about building um, linked data services that we have um, done a very poor job of actually finding things to do with it um, and to make use of it within our systems. In fact, um, seems like to me the, the most obvious thing to use it for would be authority control, but um, you know, you see very little in terms of like current system development working on this stuff. Um, so in fact, it's hard enough sometimes just to get systems to allow you to store the data. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, I have been trying to do within MarkEdit is use it as a as a place to experiment with different ways in which we can make use of some of the linked data um, resources that are there. And if the linked data um, concepts are embedded into the records, um, what could you do with them to, to try and make sure that the, the, um, the records are, are being um, used and that the information that's embedded into those records are actually being used. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about how MarkEdit's process works. Um, MarkEdit's process is like a lot of things. It's um, it's uh, configuration based. So um, rather than me being the one that has to create uh, the rules files, although I do manage the rules files, um, there is places for folks to um, make their own changes. And I'll talk about why that's the case. Um, how you can embed um, these services into either into your workflows, either through tasks or other processes. Uh, we'll talk about um, Mark Edit Sparkle support uh, and how that's implemented right now and um, how it gets used. And then we're going to look at something that I just put out yesterday, um, an XML editor in Mark Edit. Um, and this is really a lightweight XML editor. It's really designed um, for very specific purpose. Um, uh, I I, ha I have full version, full full um, XML editors um, in my tool set, uh, particularly tools like Oxygen, um, but they do take a really long time to load. And for a lot of things, they tend to be overkill for what I'm working on. Um, and so I wanted to have a very simple XML editor that would allow me to do um, work um, on, 
on systems, particularly when it's a system that doesn't have um, a, a dedicated XML editor attached to it, since Oxygen is a is it cheap to buy, and so I have it only on a handful of on, on, on a handful of dedicated machines. So that's essentially what we're going to talk about. I don't know if we'll, I, this may be a shorter session. It just depends on what kind of questions you guys have. So let's go ahead and go through. And like normal, I will go have some slides, um, but we'll go back and forth um, with the application because I find that's uh, easier to work with, uh, showing examples of how things work. All right. So. Um, Mark edit and link data in general. So um, since Mark edit six, uh, I've been working um, on including a link data platform um, within the application. This work started in conjunction with um, some uh, uh, working groups that were um, working in the PCC uh, to talk about how um, concepts could be embedded into into Mark records and what that might look like uh, to um, talk about and think about how that might work. Uh, I used Mark Edit as kind of a reference implementation. And it's interesting because the, the work has kind of evolved as, as that process has gone through, um, particularly around um, uh, the support for data for reconciliation, uh, the types of services that are available and how those services um, are, are made available. Um, so I try to um, add collections. Uh, so um, link data data sources, and I'll show you where those live um, as I find out about them and have a chance to test them um, so that they can be used within the application uh, and that you have a reference implementation of how they work. Um, but I also try and, um, when I do that, uh, talk to the individual data providers as well, partly because MarkEdit is a lot of these services aren't designed to work at scale and Mark Edit's gonna push them at scale. And so um, the idea is to try and work with folks to find out how um, the tool can interact with their services without taking their services down. Um, because in the early days, Mark Edit was responsible for taking a lot of linked data services down um, due to the, uh, the, the ability to make a large number of requests in a very short time. Um, the framework's being utilized um, in MarkEdit uh, for development of a tool set called MarkNext. Uh, this is a space where I put things as I'm working on them um, uh, that uh, are in more of a state of flux. So experimental stuff, I'll show you where those live. Um, so let's go ahead and just uh, open MarkEdit and talk about kind of how this is working. So. So Mark Edit has, um, from the screen, uh, folks know the, the only buttons that are in Mark Edit that don't change are this one, this one, and this one here, um, the Mark Next button as of Mark Edit 6. Uh, this is a place where I've been putting content as I work on things. And so right now, there are four items there. One is the uh, BibFrame testbed which is a tool that allows you to convert mark records or records of other types. Right now, I think I have, um, uh, let's see, different data serials. There we go, the types. So mark, mark, XML, EAD, FGDC, mods, onyx. So the ability to convert different data types um, from that data type into bib frame representation. Uh, the tool is essentially using um, the uh, XSLTs that, um, uh, the Library of Congress and the BibFrame group are putting together, um, making a few changes so that they work within MarkEdit, um, and then facilitating the process of converting data from one of those uh, data serializations into um, the, the current BibFrame structure, um, BibFrame 2 or the uh, deprecated BibFrame 1, depending on what you were looking at. Um, in terms of an actual bib frame editor, MarkEdit doesn't have a, a built-in bib frame editor per se. There's an XML editor, so you could edit data in XML, but um, the tool doesn't have a, uh, an interface to, to specifically um, edit bib frame records the, the way that, say, like you have um, web-based interfaces are, are showing up. Um, part of that is because I'm still thinking about what this might look like, especially within conceptual framework of how mark edit works which is really designed as a um, as a batch record editing tool so it's kind of thinking about how that that works um, within the application since most most editors right now are really designed for for individual record editing or instance editing work editing and so um, that's a, a different 
kind of a um, structure than the way Mark Edit has traditionally been designed to work. And so thinking about how that might work in the longer run. Um, so the one I'm going to talk about right now is the linked identifier. So this is a tool that started out as a proof of concept. It's now built into the application directly um, and has the ability to um, uh, be used in the Mark editor to be um, attached to a task, uh, be run in the command line tool, all those different things. Uh, so the way that this tool works is this tool works um, by utilizing uh, the rules file that's here. So this rules file um, uh, defines for Mark edit. Um, which fields and subfields uh, are appropriate for reconciliation, uh, which subfields have data that should be um, used for reconciliation, and how that reconciliation should happen, because there are certain normalization techniques that need to be utilized, whether you're working with um, names, identities, subjects, in order for most um, reconciliation services to be able to respond to a request. Um, and so the tool includes rules that are built around that. The rules file in this case is Mark 21 focused. Um, I have a proof of concept rules file for Unimark um, uh, that uh, the folks who are using Unimark can use. Um, but because of the way that the, um, the reconciliation services work and the way that you need to be able to um, pull records and information and records together. This is one of those parts of the application that is very, um, uh, that isn't agnostic and can't be because I have to be able to know which fields um, uh, are attached to different kinds of types of information. So um, you need to know, for example, that uh, uh, things in the 1xx and the 7xx are going to resolve against um, some kind of a name authority. Um, in order for the reconciliation to work right. So, so that's how the tool works. And so the tool has been designed so that it has ID services, um, auto detects main entry. Again, these are all defined within the rules file, auto detects subject IDs, process 3XX fields. Um, you can turn those on and off. Um, by default, Mark Edit will resolve against every collection, every linked data repository that it has defined and that shows up within your records. Um, but you can limit resolution to a specific um, collection that's been defined within the application. Um, or as well as you can embed work IDs. So um, within OCLC, they have a um, work identifier for um, uh, resources. You can have that embedded into record sets. Um, you just have to make sure that there's an OCLC number in the in the space. So these, these collections, they go up and down, um, link data sources. If you want to check and see um, if they're running, you can click on status and it'll go through and check all of the resources that it's aware of and it'll ping them and see if they're working. Um, so you can do that ahead of time. Uh, if for some reason you're having trouble. Um, also remember a couple things about reconciliation. The tool is going out and it's talking to a lot of services remotely. Um, if you're not on a connection that's, um, that it has uh, some oomph, um, it might take a little while uh, for resolution to finish. Even on a, a broadband connection, it takes a little while to finish. Some of that has to do with the fact that Mark Edit, uh, because I talked to the, the, vin, the individual folks that put these services up, um, Oftentimes, uh, they'll have methods within the HTTPS, uh, they'll use methods within the HTTPS status protocol to let MarkEdit know when the service is being overwhelmed. And MarkEdit will respect those um, uh, status codes and will slow down reconciliation um, in order to, to not overwhelm the service. So let's see what this actually means in practice. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually reconcile some data and then we'll talk about how it actually worked. So um, actually, let me go ahead and grab. So this is a test record. This is just a handful of records um, that I pulled from OCLC. Um, so we have um, a lot of 1xx data. We have some 600 information. There's some fast data here. Um, so the tool has uh, some, some information to go chew through. So we'll go ahead and we'll process that. So I'm going to go ahead and open 
in the linked tool. We could have done this in the uh, could have done this in the mark editor, but I'll go ahead and run it here. So we'll go ahead and pick the file um, where we're going to save it. save it as a MRCC or a MARC file. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it as an MRK file so that I can read it. Um, the rules file is pointed to here, so we'll look at the rules file here in a minute. We'll go ahead and tell it to process that data. And so the tool um, threads lookups across the individual records. So um, it won't jump ahead of records, but so if there's 20 records, that 20 fields to be looked up, mark edit will thread all of those requests at once and then wait until that individual record has been completed before it moves on to the next record. Um, it caches data locally, so if it looks up a term, it won't have to look it up again during your session. Uh, so for example, when I have for test reconciled large data sets, so for example, like the Ohio State catalog, roughly about six and a half million records. Um, at somewhere around a million records, reconciliation starts speeding up because more data is cached locally than it's having to be retrieved um, remotely uh, because there's a lot of duplication that happens within um, cataloging, obviously. Uh, for subjects, we have a lot of things that have some of the same subjects. And so um, the tool will use that cache data um, during the session rather than having to keep going out and asking for the information over and over and over again. All right, so I forget how many records are in here. I want to say it's pretty close to almost done. I, I don't think there's many more records here. I, I want to say about 35 to 38, I think. Uh, something like that, maybe 40, I don't know. But you can see it's not taking too much time. Uh, the process is running, but I'm sitting in my office right now. So I'm, I'm sitting on a, uh, a broadband connection um, that even though it is a broadband connection is being stressed with all of the online work that's happening. Oh, there we go. All right, so 45 records. So in those 45 records, there were 930 URLs that were looked up. So this takes some time um, because there are a lot of resource. There's a lot of data that gets looked up in the process. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the reconciled set and see what's been reconciled. So this uses the rules file. So using the rules file, we see that in this 100 record, we pulled the, the URI for um, the id.gov. We also pulled um, the, uh, the aggregated um, instance from VOF. Again, the rules file that I have is what's specifying which um, collections to look up. Uh, the uh, three XXs are reconciled, and then we see here in the subjects, we see subjects are being reconciled here, where we got um, individual subjects either through um, ID.gov um, or through the genre headings or through uh, uh, FAST, if that's appropriate. So the tool goes out and it reconciles as much data as it possibly can. And you'll find sometimes that it can't reconcile pieces of information. So in this case, this 610 um, didn't return back an ID um, when it looked it up in um, ID.gov, um, but other ones did. So um, the tool facilitates that process. For those who want to make this a, um, a part of their workflow, um, you can, like I said, um, build this into the tasks in the uh, manage task space. Uh, if you look at um, the options in the tasks, you can see that you can add a linked data task and that essentially allows you to decide which ID services you want to process, set the rules file, um, and then set that as a linked data task. And now the tool will um, reconcile data um, as part of um, your process. Um, does it also search Wikidata? So at this point um, in the rules file, I've, um, I haven't uh, uh, configured a collection for Wikidata. I use a, a DB. Uh, well, let me, let's look at what collections are done. I haven't done Wikidata and there's present, there, there's actually a reason why. Um, the, in order for the service to work, uh, the, the reconciliation endpoint has to be able to, to answer uh, a very specific question. Uh, and that question needs to be, is this term um, uh, 
valid or not. Um, a lot of ID services don't answer questions that way. They answer questions as, uh, more as um, uh, recommendations. They give back results, even when the result isn't an exact match. Um, and that's problematic within the market at reconciliation service. So um, at one point, that was how Wikidata worked. Um, I'm not sure if it still does, so I'd have to look, uh, but I haven't created a Wikidata reconciliation. At this point, there's um, a reconciliation for DBpedia, um, which is what um, I had set up originally um, for this service. Uh, but uh, I do go back and I look at the uh, collections um, periodically and I add collections as people ask for them. So um, I know that Wiki uh, data has changed. Uh, Wikipedia has updated some of their um, endpoints so I can take a look at it and see if it's any better. So the entire linked data process works um, through the rules file. And in fact, um, I, could, I could also say that if you wanted to um, add a tool like Wikidata to uh, mark edits rules file, you're welcome to add it uh, if you can figure out how. Um, and if it works, let me know and I can add it to the master rules file. So uh, the way the rules file works is the tools designed around um, knowing um, which fields to reconcile, subfields that are used in reconciliation, um, the uh, URI uh, that gets generated and where um, it will find um, information about which collection it needs to look up, to, to use to look up. Um, so um, uh, let, me grab a, let me grab my record set again. All right, so what does that mean in real, in real terms? So let's use um, this here as an example. Uh, the, the 600 field. So if we look um, in the, uh, the editor here, we see um, the structure of the individual rule. The field is defined and reconciliation only will occur if that field is, uh, if it's being reconciled in a bibliographic record, not an authority record, um, it's looking at the tag for the 600. These are the subfields that have been defined as being appropriate for reconciliation. You will notice that not all of the subfields that are in a particular record, in a particular field, defined for a particular field, show up in the subfields category. This is an, an evolving space. When MarkEdit first started built, when I first built this rules file, um, the number of subfields that could be used was much, much smaller. And this is partly for, because like tools like id.gov had a smaller subset of data um, loaded into the tool. And in order to reconcile, I have to provide it a, um, a set of information that exactly matches what's in id.gov to get that yes or no answer. And the subfields that were allowed to use to be used for that process was much, much smaller. As LCs worked in their BibFry project and expanded ID.gov, the number of subfields that can be used um, to be appropriate for that lookup has expanded. And so as it expands, I add it to the rules file and expand it. Um, sometimes I don't get it, uh, I don't expand it fast enough, and people will ask me. Um, in fact, one happened recently where in 700, I hadn't expanded to pick up, um, uh, I think it was uh, subfield R and subfield N. Um, rather, since, I, since everything is rules file based, all I had to do was go into the rules file, add those two elements, push it to my server, and everybody who uses Mark Edit that's from version 7 to, I want to say 7.2.9. So anybody who's updated the program since um, February would have automatically gotten those changes without having to update the application because the application automatically pulls these rules files um, from the web. So um, it makes the process something. It makes the process easier for me to manage, and it makes it easier um, for other people to manage if they need to expand um, the reconciliation uh, because I've missed something. And they don't want to wait for me to update the master file. So you can see here the subfields that are used. 
Um, here it determines indicators, and these indicators are defined to help MarketIt know which collection to use for reconciliation. So in the 600, if it's indicator two is a zero, we use uh, name authority and LCSH. If it's a subfield one, we use uh, the, uh, I think those are the LCSH uh, child subject headings. Two is mesh, and then seven is none, because the value in the index, the subfield two, will define which collection is being used for reconciliation. And then MarkEdit will evaluate the collections that have been defined within the application to see if there's a linked data source that MarkEdit is aware of to do reconciliation. Um, so if you have a reconcil, if you know of somebody who has an, uh, a reconcil uh, an ID, uh, a linked data repository that has either a Sparkle, JSON, or API endpoint, um, and it's not defined, um, you can let me know. We can try and work on creating a definition for it. Uh, the URI here tells MarkEdit where the URI that's generated gets put. So in this case, it's going to, by default, it goes into the subfield zero. You can also define special um, vocab. So additional lookups that go beyond what's defined in this individual field. And in this case, I want to also reconcile against VOF because um, I would like to have that aggregation and I'll put it inside the subfield one. And then there's any special instructions. So in this case, um, things that show up in the 600 field um, can be either name authority or subjects. And so we tell it that it's a mixed um, for special instructions, and it uses a set of normalization instructions that's appropriate for both subjects and name authorities so that the reconciliation will work with as many services as possible. So the tool uses these rules to define how to figure out which pieces of information to extract from a record set and then to pass that on to the individual collection um, for reconciliation. So the tool defines um, up here in the, uh, the block, uh, the comment block, um, what values are expected within a rules file, um, a rules definition. And there are examples throughout the, the, the block here so you can see how it works. Um, and then in addition to the rules, there's a collections block. And this block defines which collections MarkEdit can reconcile against. Some of these are used and some of these aren't used. So this one right here is no longer used. This is an older version of ID.gov that used um, uh, um, uh, open search to look data up. Um, there's a more efficient process, which is this one here, which uses um, labels. Uh, MarkEdit includes um, normalization rules. So normalization, as we talked about in other um, webinars, have to do with how UTF-8 data is passed. Um, LC's uh, web-based ID.gov tools um, prefer canonical formatted data, even though LC's mark data will be in KD notation. So MarkEdit will facilitate the um, normalization conversion so that lookups can occur with data that has diacritics. Um, but you can see here the collections that are defined. We have the NACO service, we have um, uh, the subject service. Uh, names and subjects is a mixture of um, NACO and LCSH headings, um, children's headings, demographics, uh, um, thesaurus for geographic materials genre forms, mediums, um, RDA content types. This is an interesting one because it would be preferable to reconcile directly against the RDA um, uh, vocabularies, um, but we can't, even though RDA, the RDA um, uh, access points have um, linked data representations, they don't provide a service for lookup. And without a service for lookup, those resources are literally useless within MarkEdit. Um, and any service that does reconciliation, unless they load that data locally. And again, because MarkEdit isn't tied specifically to um, Mark 21 um, RDA rule sets, uh, it's very difficult to, um, within the application, 
constantly be storing these kind of localized data sets um, because they are only appropriate for maybe about um, two thirds of the user community. Um, so I use id.gov, which has a RDA contact service there um, to do the reconciliation for this process. Uh, Getty's Arts and Architecture Thesaurus, the ULAN Thesaurus, Medical Subject Headings, Fast Headings. Um, fast Headings are kind of interesting because you can see that there's different types of ways that the tool does application. So there's a URI for lookup, there's a pattern and regular expression as well. So Mark Edit can embed um, patterns and regular expressions within the way that it processes its data. Let's see a comment show up here. Um, LD4 lookup service has a solution, possibly something. Oh, what? I don't. Oh, for RDA lookups, um, maybe I'd have to look and see um, what the what the uh, solution is. Um, again, um, MarkEdit works by supporting um, either Sparkle. Uh, what MarkEdit would like to have is some kind of a source that returns back a JSON response, um, uh, ideally, um, if the lookup service. Um, has a JSON response, then possibly that would be appropriate. Um, I'm just not sure. Um, I, I'm actually very disappointed in the RDA folks in general because the service actually should be a part of there. And I've been talking about, I've been asking for, for almost three years. It shouldn't be hosted outside of that service, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the uh, VOF lookups, so how MarkEdit interacts with VOF, National Library of Israel, the Japanese Diet Library, German National Library, National Library of Korea, um, ISBN, uh, I, ISNI, um, and then DBpedia. Um, there are um, some additional, um, yeah, exactly. Um, so there's um, there are additional um, ID services. Um, I know I've had some folks ask, uh, some folks in Australia have asked about the reconciliation service there. I've been waiting for some information. Um, I'm working with the Bibliographic National. They have a service that um, appears to work with MarkEdit. I just haven't brought it into the collection set. So I'm working on a handful of other collections. But the collection sources are actually very straightforward um, to create. You have a number of, you have structures on how this works. Um, the, really the only criteria around how MarkEdit's reconciliation service works is there are some assumptions that are made um, primarily that the results that come back um, have a JSON um, response. So um, that is the, the best response um, for building tools within, building collection specific reconciliation within the application. Um, and so when that happens, you basically just build a path here, which tells MarkEdit where in the JSON file it's gonna find that response. Um, and that makes it so that the, the tool can work. Um, if the tool doesn't provide a JSON response, um, it can still work. It just requires me to, to, to take a closer look at how the, uh, the, the data is retrieved um, and potentially having to build in um, some special logic into the linked data tool, which I'm not super, which I don't, which I try not to do often, um, but I have done. So for example, the id.gov service, the linked data label service is not a JSON response. Um, it's a response that comes back, um, uh, I believe in the, the, um, the X, um, uh, X uh, header fields. Um, and so, because Mark Edit doesn't actually ask for data in the LC tools, um, because I want to have a light as light a touch as possible. This was a conversation we had with LC because Marquette was was generating a lot of response requests, um, and so the tool does basically just a, a head request um, to LC and reads just the um, the 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 um, the header tags back. Um, and the X header tags give me all the information that I need um, in order to reconcile the result. Um, so in cases where that's appropriate, we can, I can make some specific changes, although those tend to be very specific and um, what I would consider outlier cases. And the LC, given the importance of Library of Congress, not just to US um, catalogers, but to a broader, broader group, 
that was something I was willing to do in terms of a, an outlier. Um, national libraries probably tend to be the group that I would work most commonly in that space. But for most folks, like I said, JSON is, is the, the best approach for that. So the tool basically is just rules based. So you create your rules within the space. Um, once those rules are present, then the tool can work straight through the, uh, the linked data tools for building resources. Um, and, and that should be it. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility. And like I said, if, um, if I have not, um, if, if for example, I haven't included all the information in a rules file and I need to make a change like I did this last week, um, as long as the option uh, here is uh, selected, check online updates, online for updates. And I believe that as of February, that was turned on by default. Um, mark edit will check um, the uh, mark edit updating service and look to see if any of the rules files for either the validator, um, the, uh, the link data tools, the um, RDA tools, the, to see if any of those rules files have changed. And if they have, it'll download and update and apply it. It's the first time you open the application um, once those rules files have been updated and then you'll have them um, going forward. Uh, makes the process easier for me. It makes it easier for me to, to um, uh, uh, react to changes as well as push new collections to users um, faster. Okay, let's see what I have here. Blah, blah. Oh, editing. So editing linked data sources. Um, so the tool has two ways to edit the rules file. Um, inside of here, there's the how do I edit the rules file. So the tool has a graphics, a graphic way to do it. You can click on this and it'll show you the, the individual parts and you can pick and choose um, pieces and then save them. Um, same thing with collection rules. You can select collection rule. It'll give you the information about that collection rule. I will be honest. I never edit the rules this way. I just prefer to edit them in the XML file. So this is the, the XML view that's being used. I prefer to edit them here. Um, this is, uh, but you have the option to figure out which you would prefer. Uh, the tool does make a copy of your um, rules file when you edit them. So if for some reason you've made a mistake, um, the uh, rules file will be replicated. Uh, if for some reason it doesn't get replicated, uh, you can always find, um, uh, you can always restore um, your uh, rules files um, by doing one of two things. Uh, the easiest way to restore your rules file back to um, scratch is to just uh, find it. So this is the rules file within Mark Edit and delete it. And the first time Mark Edit runs, it'll put it back and it pulls um, the uh, last known good copy. Uh, your other option would be if you keep Mark Edit's automatic updates on, um, you can recover from a settings backup. The daily, it keeps, keeps track of those backups and you can just uh, open it up and pull your rules file back. All right, so if, the, uh, if you can do this kind of reconciliation um, and put URLs in the records, um, what might you do with them? So uh, obviously one of the, the question that keeps coming up is why would I even put these URIs in my records if my catalog um, or the services that I use um, can't make use of them at all? And that's actually a really good question because honestly it's depressing to spend a lot of time building these URIs and finding that they can't be used um, within the current systems and, and honestly may not have a use, most systems may not even have a use for them um, for quite some time. Um, so within Mark Edit, I've been experimenting with different ways to make use of the data if it's there and if it's not to utilize the services that are in place um, to do something useful. Um, so one example of that is Mark Edit includes what's called a, a validate heading service. This service um, utilizes the rules file to resolve name and subject um, headings. 
and generate um, a report uh, in terms of which headings are, are valid and which ones aren't. Um, the tool can uh, update headings for you in real time, so correct variants. Uh, so for example, if it's working with LC, um, LC's tools will tell you when a um, heading has changed uh, and there's the new accepted heading and it can change that for you in real time. Um, it can embed the URIs as part of the process. Um, it can download LC's authority records um, for the data that it finds as it's as it's um, reconciling, uh, validating your headings. Um, it can also help you generate brief name authority records for the data that you have at hand if it can't reconcile that data in real time. Um, the, ray, the, the reason why originally this tool was created um, was it at, at Ohio State, we had wondered, um, would it make any sense um, to potentially reconcile data and see what information we have um, that can be reconciled so we know the headings are good um, before we send out um, subsets of our database to a vendor to do authority control. Um, you know, the, the, the cost actually wasn't the issue. It was more of a question about uh, could that work be done in-house? And, and the reality is it, it could be um, uh, in, in looking at the reconciliation groups um, for the data sets that we would usually send out on, I believe, a monthly basis, the tool um, could reconcile and pull um, authority records um, for probably about 70% of the content that was there, um, shrinking the number of records that actually would need to be um, uh, dealt with by an external vendor or locally. Um, we don't do that here. We still send it out, um, partly because it's just easy within the workflows that we have um, to do it, and the cost isn't, isn't significantly high enough to, um, to, to require us looking at another option. Um, but it does provide a, a process. And so I do know um, that we, we can use this, though, to validate records. Now, the nice thing about the validation tool is if you have reconciled your records, the tool will use the URI in your record set to see if the, the data is still appropriate. Has the data changed? And if it has, it flags it within the, the report that gets generated um, by the tool. So I'm constantly looking for ways to reuse um, the data that's being built into the application that, that's being pulled either through the reconciliation services or ways that I can reuse the reconciliation services um, to do interesting things within the application. Um, this talks about how that works. So Sparkle within MarkEdit. So obviously the, the rules file within MarkEdit makes use of Sparkle um, as one particular type of um, service endpoint to extract data um, for use within the application for reconciliation purposes. To make it easier for folks to um, see how a service may work, because um, uh, one of the things I found um, in playing with a lot of these reconciliation services, uh, you actually have to know a little bit about um, the, uh, the data model that's being used in order to create a, um, a search that will actually provide a good reconciliation endpoint. Um, you need a way to be able to do that. So MarkEdit builds in a simple um, Sparkle tool that allows you to, for example, and that gives you some examples so you can actually see what a Sparkle query looks like, um, so that you can actually uh, make requests um, to the service and then see what the results come back. Um, and this is really important because if you remember in the rules file, you had to tell MarkEdit how to read the JSON file to find the URI that gets generated. So there's the URI that I want. So how does MarkEdit read this JSON response in order to find that URI? So that helps you be able to look through the resource and be able to see it. Now, one of the things that's interesting is um, MarkEdit's Sparkle endpoint works um, for remote services. So there's the examples here, so you can see different examples of how that works. You can also load a local um, 
RDF file um, into MarkEdit and have MarkEdit be able to query that local RDF file, so that local um, triple file. So, um, and you can in the rules file um, actually download, um, and I've done this for reconciliation um, locally, download a local um, uh, RDF triple file um, and do your reconciliation strictly against a local data file. There are limits. The um, LCSH um, uh, children's uh, subject headings, um, when you pull that file into MarkEdit, I believe it creates somewhere in the neighborhood of 700,000 triples for lookup. Um, it takes about 15 seconds to load. Now, once it's been loaded, it lookup is instantaneous. So it's faster than having to go out and resolve um, to the result to the remote resource. But it takes a lot of memory to pull that into the resource. Um, so there are practical limits for the load local data file um, option um, to use that for reconciliation purposes. But for um, for local um, reconciliation of catalogs, when I've helped people do this work, a lot of times when I'm creating rules files specifically for that work, one of the things I'll be doing is looking at the, um, the services that would be used for reconciliation and determining how large those services are and would they be appropriate to download for this purpose and use a local, use a local um, um, triple file for reconciliation or use the online source. And using a hybrid approach, we can speed up a lot of reconciliation that happens um, within that, that initial process. Uh, so like I said, there's the browser. Um, but if you look at the rules file again, look at the collections. Uh, you will see that uh, these collections, some of these collections, so for example here, um, this is Sparkle queried to the Getty. So um, Sparkle's being utilized as part of the process um, to one of the appropriate processes for doing lookup. Um, same thing here, Sparkle query. So the tool builds framework components and then allows you to utilize those framework components within different parts of the application. Um, and these are the things that it can do. And here's an example for example of the local children's heading. I don't I didn't I don't have the LC children's subjects heading, I don't think still on my computer. Um, I'm not going to look for it. I, I used to keep it, but I don't, I'm not doing any reconciliation with it right now. All right, so um, XML editing. So this is new to Mark Edit. Um, and like I said, the, the use case right now is fairly narrow, but I'll go ahead and show you where it is, how to turn it on. Um, I'm definitely taking feedback from folks um, about uh, how it could be improved. So uh, the use case for this was um, I often find myself on my on a on a laptop that I take places um, that's my personal machine that doesn't have oxygen on it. Um, my work machine, the machines I use for um, a lot of the stuff that I do for for work here at Ohio State, yeah, that has the software on it because Ohio State paid for it, um, and and so I have a license to it and I have it running there. Um, I have to be a little more judicious when I'm paying for software myself, and so I don't have a need to have that tool most of the time. But I do obviously need to be able to edit XML records um, and to be able to test uh, transformations um, a lot of times in the work that I'm doing. So a lot of times that ends up being done um, a little bit ad hoc, and so I was getting tired of doing that. So I've been working on and have been using for a while an XML editor that's been built into Mark Edit. Um, it's gotten to the point where I think it's good enough, it's stable enough that I can make it available for other people to use. Um, so the way that you turn it on, because uh, you, won't, you won't see it by default, is you, if you want to see it on your front screen, you would go to set default programs. You'll find it on the bottom. Uh, you check it. 
um, and tell it to um, click OK. The tool will save that and then you'll see it show up in your main screen. You'll also find it under Tools, um, Utilities, XML Editor. You will notice that in the current version of Mark Edit, this Tools menu has consolidated a little bit. That was because it was starting to get really long, so I moved things underneath the tool a Utilities window. Um, you can also find it under um, the search by typing in XML and you'll find the editor. Uh, so um, you have it, you open it up. Um, it's a basic, uh, fairly basic editor. Um, I'll go ahead and grab a file. Um, this is a, uh, an EAD file. So I'm going to tell you um, what it's doing. So the tool by default, um, I want it to constantly be validating. So as I'm creating records, the tool is constantly validating itself. If there's a pause of five seconds, validation will create, will finish. Um, the only way that that's turned off is if the file size is larger than, uh, I believe I set the limit. I think I set the limit at uh, five megabytes. So at five megabytes, the, the file stops automatically validating. You have to actually click the validation tool. But so example here, if I click that there and I'm working over here, work, 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 um, the tool will validate and say, oh, there's a error in the file. So that way I can go back and you know find where the error was and fix it. And the tool will, you know, again, I work, 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 and will go back and validate the file and tell me that's validated automatically. So that way I can see that stuff. Um, it's got simple find and replace. So find, um, you know, find it, highlight all the entries, um, replace, replace whole match. There's no regular expressions in it. That'll be kind of the next thing I'll add into the tool is regular expressions, uh, cause that I do actually need. Um, one thing that I haven't turned on yet, but is hidden, um, from the public version is evaluating XPath. So that way you can get, you can search by XPath that will show up shortly. Um, the tool has a validated document as well as transform document. This is really what I use it for most often is testing transformations. Um, so I can set a transformation element, um, go find the value that I want to test, um, and then mark edit will output the validation here so I can see what's happening. Uh, the tool works like the Mark Editor. It runs in its own instances, so I can open multiple files. So in this case, if I want to work on a validation um, at the same time that uh, I'm working on an edit, I can go over here and edit my validation, save it, go back over here and revalidate the file or retransform the file. and see the result get picked up automatically. So I can do those kind of things in the process of my work. If I want to change them, the tool remembers the document that I picked. Um, and so I can transform then against Saxon. So I want to see it work within the Saxon instance, this is the Saxon output. If I want to change the XSLT that I'm working with, I reset the path. And now I have to pick um, a XSLT, um, so it'll remember it. Um, I'm thinking I may do a little bit of work around here, kind of like the way that Oxygen does, where it'll remember things. But uh, at this point, like I said, uh, this is for very lightweight work. The editor itself will load files, XML files, into the 50 to 60 megabyte range. Um, it's not designed like MarkEdit to deal with files of infinite size. Um, But like I said, it's built for lightweight work. Uh, do I plan to add XPath in the future? So the tool actually supports XPath now. I just haven't exposed it um, because I use XPath for, or XQuery for my stuff too. Um, so yeah, um, at some point I will um, set it up so that uh, the transformation can happen via um, XQuery. Um, publicly. Um, but right now, like I said, it, it, the tool actually already supports that. It's just, um, again, it's a, a menu entry right now that's hidden um, because there's some, uh, some quirkiness and some of that. Um, also, when you're using XPath or XQuery, um, you have to limit the, uh, the, the XSLT tool set to um, Saxon uh, since the uh, 
Microsoft one doesn't include X, X query as a as part of the process. Um, yeah, so there's there are a handful of things that'll that'll eventually that that are in the tool now that'll get exposed um, later. Um, but uh, like I said, it's it's a a very lightweight tool that meets my needs. Um, happy to take feedback. I'll expand it as necessary. Um, but there, the concept for this really is to give folks an a um, workable uh, XML editor, functional XML editor um, to always have. Um, but the reality is if you need something that's more um, enterprise level, I would purchase something like Oxygen. Um, this is really designed to provide folks a, a, a tool tooling um, uh, to meet kind of what I would consider that 80% need that I run into that I like I personally run into on a regular basis. So uh, that's the concept behind it. So um, it's there. Um, it's live now. It's been something I've been working on for a while. Um, and I'm finally comfortable enough to make it available. Um, this is only a Windows only thing. It's not in the Mac version. Um, what I did do with the Mac version is in the Mark editor, I relaxed relaxed some of the validation so you can open XML files in the Mark editor. Um, but I'm not sure yet um, how I might uh, consider putting something like this into the Mac version. Um, I believe that the control that I've created for um, the XML editing, which is based on a uh, 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 some tooling that was done in the um, I Sharp um, code editor a number of years ago, will port into the Mac version, but I'm just not positive yet. I have to take a closer look at it. Um, so um, for now, this is a this is a Windows only feature until I have a chance to to really sit down and, and take a closer look at at how that might work within um, the the Apple environment. So uh, so that's what I got. Uh, what I wanted to talk about. Um, if there are any particular questions, um, I'll wait uh, for a couple of minutes here to see if there are any additional questions that are that folks have that they want to ask. Um, this is uh, um, all work that uh, is, you know, like I said, still very, some of this work is, is very stable. So the frameworks are very stable. Um, I consider the rules file, to, the rules files to be kind of in flux because they are being updated and changed on a fairly regular basis um, as additional ID services come up. Um, the XML editor obviously is something that's in development. Um, so, um, yeah. <clears throat> so I will wait, count it down here. So if there's not any questions, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and um, turn off the recording. Uh, and if you have questions that you want to follow up later, feel free. Um, Kirk, if you want to follow up on what the uh, linked data folks are doing with the RDA, I'd be interested. Um, like I said, it, as long as the data is, can be extracted as JSON, then that would be interesting. Um, it does disappoint me a little bit that the RDA folks aren't doing that work themselves, but if I have a way to use it and be more appropriate than say, that's good, set, then having to use the, um, the the ID one, the one from ID.gov, that would be great. Um, let me stop the recording here. Um, but uh